You're ready? Yes. Welcome everyone to Harvard CMSA Quantum Math in Math Physics Seminar Series. We are delighted to have uh, Gabriel. Gabriel. Gabriel is uh, a researcher at the Harvard CMSA, and he will be speaking about his uh, recent work on 3D gravity and gravitational entanglement entropy. Let me remind the audience, please feel free to interact with Gabriel, ask questions during his talk. So Gabriel, it's all yours. Please take over. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Juven. Um, thank you for the invitation to give the talk. I know that uh, there might be condensed matter audience out there. So as Juven said, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, so this is work uh, that I recently published with Joan Simone and Thomas Merchants, as well as based on work that I'm finishing up right now. So the basic um, object we want to study is the holographic entanglement entropy formula. Um, so it tells us that in a holographic CFT, if I want to compute the entanglement entropy of some uh, subregion V, that's given by the generalized entropy in the bulk. This has the leading um, area uh, over, four, over four Junction term. This is the area of a minimal surface gamma that ends on the boundary of the region B. And then there is a bulk entanglement entropy term. So let me try to actually get my pointer to work here. Yeah. So the bulk entanglement entropy term has the state counting canonical interpretation, but the area term does not. So there's a strange asymmetry between these terms here. And the question I want to ask is, uh, what is the bulk canonical interpretation of this area term? It should be understood as some kind of state count counting in the bulk. And it will be interesting to understand how this works because this area term is supposed to measure the entanglement that makes up the space time itself, as opposed to the bulk term, which measures the entanglement of quantum fields on top of a background. There's a general folklore that the entire generalized entropy, both terms, should be the entanglement entropy of bulk quantum gravity. Uh, however, um, so, so far, um, we don't understand exactly how this works. This is important, for example, for studying the sitter space, where there's no spatial infinity to anchor this um, minimal surface. So we have to understand the problem directly in bulk quantum gravity. But the problem is difficult because uh, bulk diffeomorphism in the bulk, which means there are no uh, local degrees of freedom. So we have to confront the question of how to factorize the bulk Hilbert space um, in a theory that has non-local degrees of freedom. So that's actually a problem that we've encountered before in just a pure gauge theory, which has non-local woods and loops degrees of freedom. So imagine this is a spatial slice and the degrees of freedom are closed loops because there are no uh, charges. These are uh, flux lines, and uh, we want to split the spatial slice into region V and V bar. So the picture makes it obvious that I can't actually do this while keeping all my uh, closed loops. I had to cut some of the loops into to open strings. What this means is that the factorization of the Hilbert space on this Cauchy slice is not saying that the Hilbert space is equal to a tensor product, is saying that we have to embed the Hilbert space into larger space. In this larger space, uh, I've defined it by splitting the entangling surface, uh, to, I've regulated, and then I've allowed for certain charged uh, objects at the entangling surface on which my string can end. So these extra charged objects we'll call entanglement edge modes. They're charged under some kind of symmetry, and for gauge theories, the symmetry is just a set of large gauge transformations. They're the gauge transformations living on this boundary here. Uh, and the physical Hilbert space, we can say very precisely, is inside a, a subspace of the tensor product that's invariant under the action of this symmetry. So once we have this larger Hilbert space that we embed our states inside, we can define the reduced density matrix and the entanglement entropy. And what we'll get is, in addition to a bulk entanglement entropy, some extra entropy that comes from these edge modes that have to be entangled here to make a singlet under this uh, symmetry group. So now let's go back, at least halfway back to our gravity problem, 
uh, we'll study a, a gauge theory, but in bulk quantum gravity. So this problem was considered by Dan Hollow a few years ago. We'll consider a background is ADS Schwarzschild, which has two sides. The bulk uh, theory is due to a tensor product of a, two CFTs on the left and the right boundaries. So the Hilbert space definitely factorizes into left and the right. But if I consider a bulk gauge theory and an insertion of an operator, a Wilson-Line operator, that crosses this Einstein-Rosen bridge, which is this wormhole-like geometry, it doesn't look like it factorizes unless there are some charges that allow me to split the Wilson line. They allow me to define gauge invariant uh, Wilson line inside each of these wedges. So uh, in the bulk quantum theory, these charges have to exist. And in the low energy uh, description, these are exactly what we call the entanglement edge modes. They always contribute, if I have a non-abelian gauge theory, to the entanglement entropy with a term that's log of the dimension of the representation of these charges. So now let's ask what the analogous problem is in quantum gravity. There, we want to actually take uh, space time and split the space time itself. That's what it means to factorize the Hilbert space in some sense. Um, may, and, I, may, may I ask something simple? Yeah. When you say, just make sure the left right here is just a factorization of a two part. It has nothing to do with any chirality, right? Uh, there's no, yeah, no chirality. It's just, it's just two, uh, it's a tensor product into two parts, yeah. So it can be any dimensions in, in general that, that does not require, for example, even dimensional space time. Right? No, it could be any dimensions, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But I just put the bar here because in some sense, because these have to be in a singlet, so one of them transforms in the opposite way from the other. Um, so this is a bit of a cartoon, but there is some proposal that perhaps the holographic entanglement entropy formula, the deleting area term is actually the entanglement entropy of these quantum gravity edge modes, whose entanglement glues together the space time. So I can try to be more specific about what this top uh, equation really means. On the left-hand side, if I look at the Euclidean section of this geometry, it looks like a disk uh, with some uh, circle of length beta, which is a temperature circle. If I think about half of the disk, it's a uh, path undergo on half of this prepares a state on this Einstein-Rosen bridge here. And we could, in fact, Lorentz continue this half of disk into this uh, two-sided geometry. Now, to get to what this right-hand side means, what we have to do is consider removing a small disk from the center with some boundary condition that I'm just gonna label E. It's called a shrinkable boundary condition because it is designed so that it doesn't change the path and on this disk. So there's some kind of holography here in the sense that there are some quantum mechanical degrees of freedom on the boundary that replaces the disk here. And those are what we call the edge modes. Now, if I think about the lower half of this uh, annulus, uh, it looks like a path interval that prepares a state on two regions, V and V bar. And if I, Lorenz continue this geometry, I'll get this kind of disconnected geometry, but they will be entangled. And that's really what this right-hand side is supposed to mean. I'll be more specific later on, but this is sort of a uh, general kind of concept for what it means to factorize the Hilbert, the Hilbert space of the bulk quantum gravity. Now, what I said just should, now, yeah, go ahead. When you earlier show the entanglement of edge modes, S edge is log of dimension A layer. What's the A layer? Is it A? Yeah, there... some representation of this symmetry. Uh, sorry, I see what you mean. So sorry, maybe this is different. I, I, maybe this is bad notation. So um, let so here, um, well, it will turn out that in, in order to split the space time, I have to sum over many representations. That's why I put the sum over A here. That was that a question that. And there A is the same A as the dimension, log of dimension A there. Yeah, it's the same A. It's the same A. It's a is just a representation of the, of the symmetry, G, S, but it turns out that we have to sum over symmetries here, but but yeah, we can ignore this sum for now. This is some, right now it's just a cartoon, 
we, I haven't said precisely what this picture means, but uh, but A labels representations. Oh, but what do you mean by symmetry here? Or, or do you just mean the A here is some factorization of a Hilbert space that that? Mm -hmm. that yeah, so so the symmetry would be earlier. I was saying that um, there is some symmetry acting on this entangling surface that uh, acts on these charges, and in gauge theory, these would be the large gauge symmetries, which are gauge symmetries restricted to the, this surface. Um, and explaining what this symmetry is for gravity is exactly the point of this talk, basically. So I'll explain what the symmetry is for for three D gravity. Okay, thanks. Sorry, Gabriel, I also have a question. Yeah. On your previous slide, so if you think that you're doing a gauge theory, like, I don't know, there's QED in the bulk or something like that, then you would split the Hilbert space and, you know, you would have a bunch of positive charges, positive and negative charges that would help you do that. You Are, are those the edge modes you're talking about or are you talking about large gauge transformations? Because those two things are not the same thing, right? You can have charge matter in, in given representations or you can have large gauge transformations. Those two things are different, right? Right, right. So I'm thinking now of pure gauge theory, so I have no matter. Okay, you're, uh, you're thinking of a pure gauge theory. Yeah, I, I, I have a pure gauge theory because I'm also going to talk about pure 2D gravity. Okay, thanks. So um, the question that I'm asking is more much more tractable in 3D um, because Classically, 3D gravity is equivalent to Chern Simon's theory with PSL2R times PS2R gauge group. The idea is that the dynamical space time geometry can be encoded into the field space. So the, the two components of the uh, SL2R times SL2R connection can be related to the field bind and the spin connection. And in this formulation, uh, there are two sided black holes, which can be identified with Wilson line defects in the Chern Simon's theory. So uh, the mass and the spin of a black hole can be viewed as the representation label of a Wilson line that threads this wormhole. So the question we should ask now is what would be the charge object that would split this Wilson line? And the naive answer that they're gonna be the PSL2R times PSL2R edge modes won't be correct. And the reason is that the shrinkable binary condition for the gauge theory is not the same as the one for the gravity. This question of edge modes has a uh, direct consequence for a very tantalizing proposal made by um, th these people. They propose that 3D gravity is actually a topological phase in which the black hole entropy is a topological entanglement entropy. So topological entanglement entropy is sort of well studied in condensed matter. It is the entanglement entropy of anion edge modes. Anions, the collective degrees of freedom that describe the topological phase, they're described by some kind of TQFT associated to a modular tensor category that is usually given by the rep, uh, representation of a loop group or some quantum group. Now, the proposal uh, that 3D gravity is topological phase suggests that the bulk microstates can be described by gravitational anions. So the natural question is, what is the TQFT and what is the modular tensor category? Uh, let's, so let me say uh, more specifically why uh, th this proposal was made. What was the evidence for it? So um, these authors found that if we study the area function of a two-sided BTC black hole as a function of mass and spin, it's equal to log of a modular S matrix. It's the S matrix for the Virasora algebra. Um, and now this takes a similar form as the uh, topological entanglement entropy in Chern Simon's theory. However, there's a puzzle because the usual edge modes that we use in Chern Simon's theory um, give an entanglement entropy of this form. There's a leading area term, which is divergent because it's regulator here, epsilon. But then there's a log of a modulus matrix, except that the ordering of indices is opposite. And in fact, this virus S matrix has uh, is not symmetric. So if we use this ordering of the indices, we just get zero. Uh, and in addition to the fact that this term is not right, this term is also not right because black hole entropy should be finite. So this, this UV divergence shouldn't be there. I put a quotation around area because 
the area here in usual transcendence theory is measured with respect to a, a fixed background metric. But in quantum gravity, we shouldn't be fixing a background metric in the bulk of the space time. So this term is suspect. So the nutshell is that something has to change. Gravity modifies this calculation to turn the entanglement entropy into log of a modular S matrix but with a different ordering of indices. So my talk is basically- Sorry, let me yeah. ask something naive. I think earlier you referred to topological entanglement entropy analogy to uh, 3D transcendent theory for the, maybe for the compact Lie group and also the modular tensor category. And the analogy to the gravitational side, I think you would say gravitational anions and possibly for this non-compact Chen Simons theory, right? Non-compact gauge group Chen Simons. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I didn't say what the answer is, but yeah, I was hoping the natural question is what is the analog of these, right? For right. Gravity, yeah. So, so probably this will not even be modular. I'm not sure, but it probably is not modular tensor category, right? Exactly. So uh, I'll, there are some work in the literature that already proposes something that's like a modular tensor category, but it's not exactly like it. But is whatever mathematical, whatever uh, yeah category describes the bulk theory, right? So um, yeah, it's not going to be exactly like the same kind of modular tensor category. You're right. Well, I, I, I yeah okay. I, I suppose we don't even have a finite rank of the modular S matrix for this gravitational. Yes, this is infinite. Yeah. So indeed, these these indices are infinite. So there are infinitely many primaries. So A is a continuous index. Okay. Yeah. yeah like, so, so, sorry, can you uh, just summarize again? So this part, are you trying to throw away something to get a topological entanglement entropy in this slide? Uh, well, okay. this is a puzzle. This is a puzzle. This is this is an observation. So if I the, the virial S matrix matrix has a form such that um, in some limit, it reproduces the area of black hole, black holes. Uh, and, and that seems like a, uh, that's a, can't just be a coincidence. And the fact that um, it, it was suggested this is a topological entanglement entropy is based on this formula, but this formula is not right. So I, I, this is the puzzle that my talk is trying to address. I don't have an answer. I just have the puzzle here. So, okay. so, so this, this is the right idea that somehow there's something topological about this area term, right? Notice this area is not, it's not, it's definitely not this area, right? It's not the area term in the normal QFT in time entropy, but it's also not quite this term because the indices are in the wrong order. So, so the, the talk is supposed to be, right? I'm trying to, sort of set up a question and then we're going to find out how does gravity modify the normal sort of CS calculation so that this pops out and we compute bulk entanglement entropy. Okay, but, but what's the difference between S0, A or A0? Shouldn't that be symmetric? No, no, that's the, that's the point. It, 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 as you said, this is an, for non-compact, for virial symmetry, mm -hmm. it's not rational CFT. Yeah. Um, so this S matrix is not symmetric. So the, the, if you do the opposite ordering, then you get zero. Uh, you, the usual interpretation of the data will be uh, the, the Wilson line, uh, braid around a trivial line, and, and there is some factor of the volume, maybe you need to di divide it by, and, and naively it looks symmetric. But do, do, well, uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying, let's write down exactly what um, uh, well, let's write down a definition like this, where I'm usually there's a sum here, right? There's a sum over B, but now I make an integral. And I'm just saying that the characters of the Verso algebra um, make it so that if I had chi of zero and expand it in terms of uh, some set of non-generic non ca characters, then then I get um, I get a, a integral that's non-zero. Uh, sorry, this is chi chi b here. Sorry, but if I if I do the opposite way, right? If I if I start with the uh, um, 
a non-degenerate character A that's, that's not the vacuum uh, and then and try to expand it, it, it just turns out that it has no overlap with the vacuum character, right? So, um, so the, the integral here, like there's no, um, does that make sense? The, the S0, the, the overlap of the, yeah, th that's the best way I can, this is, a, this is a, a statement about functions. We have some characters where we draw functions of tau and we're studying their modular behavior. And it's just that like, yeah, the, when I expand uh, chi A in terms of the other characters, the vacuum does not appear. That's okay. what. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to understand better later about things. Okay, okay. So let me summarize. Uh, so I know I'm getting a bit slow here, but it was maybe important to have, uh, yeah, just have this longer introduction. So in order to address this puzzle, the first thing we did was to define what we mean by 3D gravity. And in fact, we define an effective theory. Uh, we define an effective theory in which, uh, which describes a high temperature limit of the holographic CFT. Sorry, I'm having some trouble with the laser. So let me see if I can back. Um, okay, somehow my, my pointer is not working. Um, okay, I, I won't worry about that for now. In any case, um, so I should say that this uh, kind of effective theory has been in some sense studied by other people as well. But we want to propose that there's a bulk dual we should be thought of as some kind of extended topological quantum field theory, um, except that it's associated to a, a non-trivial or a novel rep, a representation category. Um, it's a representation category of this quantum group I call SLQ plus. Uh, we'll explain what that is. In this CQFT, the bulk edge modes are determined by the shrinkable binary condition I referred to earlier, which ensures that the path and go knows about the microstates in the bulk. This abstract formalism gives us subregion ray functions, factorization maps, and as well as a bulk entanglement entropy that agrees with the black hole entropy and the RT formula. And the main message is that in gauge theory, the entanglement, entanglement entropy pertains to a state in a fixed background with a Wilson line on top, on top of it. But in gravity, we have to compute the entanglement entropy that comes from splitting the space-time itself. We have to view the space-time itself as the Wilson line. And these two, two different perspectives lead to different uh, sort of uh, edge mode symmetries. There's a quantum group with this, uh, this quantum, actually semi-group on, on the left side and then the, the normal PSL2 on the right side. So here's the outline of the talk. Um, I'll start by just discussing this 3D theory of gravity uh, from the both the bulk and boundary perspective, and then go into the factorization question. So let's start with the definition of the boundary partition function. Consider a uh, moduli invariant uh, holographic CFT. It, that, that comes with the assumption that there's a gap and a sparse spectrum. Uh, we can write uh, the uh, partition function in either channels. And the characters here are the various royal characters. Uh, this is the, the chi zero, the vacuum, which is degenerate, and the chi h is a non-degenerate characters. So we assume this only various royal symmetry. At high temperatures, uh, when this ratio beta over the uh, ABS length is much smaller than the gap, the vacuum block dominates. But it's a vac vacuum block in the dual channel. So this is a well-known fact. So our idea is to just truncate to this vacuum block and define a theory purely with this uh, the vacuum block in the dual channel. Now, to get a statistical interpretation, we should go back to the original channel by doing a modular S transformation. Um, it will be useful to use Louisville notation. So this is the, a, a parameterization of the dimension. So um, we'll use P and P bar instead of H and H bar. Uh, this Q is some background charge in the Louisville theory related to a parameter B that determines the central charge C. And the modular S matrix elements here are, are given by these cinch functions. So 
a crucial observation is that these modular S matrix elements are actually the quantum dimension of this quantum group SLQ2+. Plus. This is sort of the reason that this SLQ2 plus comes up in the story. Uh, for now, it's just an observation. So I'm just going to uh, rename S0P uh, dim QP. Now, the, uh, our three gravity theory, three gravity theory has a canonical partition assumption that looks like this. Um, it's just a, 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 a normal grand canonical partition function with a density of states uh, given by these quantum dimensions. Uh, and uh, each uh, P and P bar is going to label primary states in the boundary with energy given by uh, P squared plus P bar squared and uh, the spin given by P squared minus P bar squared. The idea is that these density of states are uh, density of states for uh, heavy black hole states. And we'll explain why these have to do with black holes in a moment. But for now, we just want to check that this partition function can reproduce the black hole entropy. So now we take uh, the high temperature limit where beta over L ADS is much smaller than one. The integrand will be dominated by large P and P bar. And if we take furthermore a classical limit, which is the central charge charge very large, corresponds to this parameter B being very large, then one can check that this modular S matrix, the cinch function just becomes an exponential. And this exponential exactly reproduces the cardiac density of states. So when we compute the thermal entropy uh, in the classical limit, we just get log of the density of states. And one can check that at the subtle point, this density of states reproduces the black hole uh, area. This is a well, actually somewhat of a well-known fact that the Cardi formula for the density of states combined with the brown and uh, relation uh, between the central charge and uh, G Newton and LADS always reproduces for you the black hole entropy. So this calculation explains Perlini's uh, observation of why black hole entropy is given by log of S0P, but it explains it as a thermal entropy of a boundary theory. It doesn't give an entanglement interpretation in the book. Uh, it's also useful to notice that uh, sort of for these holographic CFTs, the um, at large central charge, the cardiac density of states is actually dominated by primary. So it's, it's not the, the descendants that, that give you the entropy. It's really the, the, the densely spaced primaries. So that was the boundary theory. Now I want to give the bulk description. So in the bulk, it's, uh, so it's known, in fact, I wish I could write here because I owe a reference. This is uh, maybe like this, oops. Kotler Jensen, and Maloney Witten. Um, so what they showed uh, is that if we do the PSL2R times PSL2R um, path integral on this solid torus, which is a torus you get by filling in the Euclidean time in the boundary, uh, if we use the boundary, uh, the gravity boundary conditions, we get precisely this vacuum character. Um, however, the usual bulk interpretation is following. This vacuum module here is viewed as perturbative fluctuations around a single Euclidean BTC saddle. So this is the, the saddle geometry. It has a, uh, so th this R squared H here is sort of where the Euclidean sort of horizon is. It's, it's the center of this disk here. Um, and it gives the mass of the black hole, which is related to the temperature. So, at this saddle point, the, the partition function has an interpretation uh, of a leading classical saddle times fluctuations around that saddle. These are the uh, boundary gravitons. And in fact, this theory is one loop exact. So the one loop uh, determinant gives you the entire uh, partition function. Uh, so the issue with this interpretation is that there's no trace interpretation to this uh, path integral. Uh, and you can see that in the geometry, that is not explicitly um, a direct product of a temperature circle with a spatial slice. And for that reason, the black hole entropy as computed in the gravity theory doesn't have a state counting interpretation. There you put, uh, you, you define the path integral to be zero beta with this boundary uh, length beta. 
and you compute th this formula uh, and you get some answer in the semi-classical approximation that's area of four G Newton. But because it's not a trace, we don't know what the states, uh, what, what states we're counting. Now, in the dual channel, we sort of have, we do have a state counting interpretation. What I mean is that as opposed to thinking about this as an empty torus, in the dual channel, it looks like we're filling in the dual torus that goes around this cycle. So we're filling, filling in the spatial cycle. And there it looks like we're summing over states on a punctured disk. It's known that, um, so this puncture creates a spatial holonomy of the gauge field around this disk. And it's known that those uh, configurations of the gauge field correspond to Lorentzian BTT black holes with mass and spin P and P bar. So in some sense, that's what the P and P bar is summing over, it's summing over these black holes given by these punctured disks or states on this punctured disk. But what we really, really want is a state counting interpretation on the left side, not on the right side. So to get the state counting interpretation on the original channel, we have to do something different. We have to remove an infinitesimal tube from this empty torus. So if we do that, then we can give this a trace interpretation. Uh, we can say more precisely what, what is this trace of this trace of some density matrix, but what is this row V? So imagine cutting this bit torus like a bagel in half. We see an annulus uh, at the, at the, at the con as a constant time, time slice. This is annulus is the Einstein-Rosen bridge to connect the left and right part of the geometry here. Um, if we imagine that we have factorization map that is produced by the path in a row, what it does is it splits this annulus into two annulus. So it splits it into V and V bar. Uh, by inserting this little half of a tube here with some special boundary condition I call E. So this constant time slice here is this slice here. And this is a picture I was drawing earlier that if we factorize the state, then the continuation will be a two disconnected geometries. Um, now, the question is, what would be the boundary condition you put here for gravity to make this uh, equation true? In PSLTR gauge three, we know the answer. Um, but that answer, when we translate into gravity, allows the conical defects in this Euclidean time direction. And gravity forbids it. In fact, the gravity constraint that we don't have conical defects always forces us to have a non-local boundary condition E. So in this talk, instead of specifying this non-local boundary condition, we we'll directly give the factorization map, which we can draw as a picture like this. The path integral we'll takes an annulus, and it evolves it into two annuli. Um, and the idea is that uh, we directly give you the Hilbert space HV and HV bar and this mapping. The, uh, there are two boundaries in these annuli V and V bar. One is at the entangling limiting surface. These will have SLQ2 plus edge modes. At the asymptotic boundaries, I call left and right, they'll have very sorrow edge modes. So that's a general picture that now part two is going to realize uh, in more detail. So before I go on, any, any questions? OK, so let's move on. So the first thing I have to tell you is what is the bulk two-sided Hilbert space? So what's the Hilbert space living on this Cauchy slide? Sorry, maybe a naive question. I guess, uh, can you summarize the previous part one? Of which part of calculation you are computing from the boundary CFT side and which one you are doing directly from the gravitational side? Right, so, Just... I'm, done. so I'm done with the boundary part. Everything now is gravitational. So this, this factorization is, uh, well, maybe that's not quite true. It, it, so for the, these two parts, I'm going to talk about black hole entropy from the bulk point of view. Everything will be the bulk. When I get to the RT formula, I'll, re, I'll go through everything again and start in the boundary again. But, but um, the, the point is that when I ask about a trace interpretation, this is only a question in the bulk. In the boundary, this is certainly a trace because this is, um, well, I, I wrote down the, the, um, in the, from the boundary point of view, I have a statistical partition function. So it's definitely counting states, right? Labeled by P and P bar. And these are primary states on the boundary. Uh, the boundary is a single Fermat module and is, is counting these states. Now, the problem is that 
See, the boundary is S1 times S1, it's a torus. So that's naturally a, a trace. But when I fill it in, that's no longer, um, if, if, when I fill it in, the spatial slice is uh, non contractible And it's not, from the point of view of the bulk, it's not a spatial slice times S1 anymore, right? Maybe that's even more obvious in, uh, in this picture. A spatial slice is an annulus, and the bagel is not an annulus times S1. And therefore, the bulk is not, is not naturally a trace. Does that make sense? Okay. So, so, so we're, we're trying to answer the question in the bulk. So how do I make the bulk path and go a trace? That, how do I realize this? Um, so maybe I didn't think seriously. So this is actually- Can I ask, can I ask a naive question? So, yeah. Well, so why this left and the right list, uh, uh, Boundary becomes the inner and the out inner and the outer circle in the in your blue like the half bagel. Right, right. What was the question? So I missed the question. You said what about the left? I, I mean, how how this? Uh, I mean, how it's like a hard hard Hawking state becomes this half bagel, and the, the left and the right boundary becomes the inner and the out, outer circle in this bagel. How, how do I see it? Is that your question? Uh, I mean, how how this picture from this, I mean, the very left of, of this picture becomes this half bagel. Uh, uh, how well, can I view this picture? Right, so this, if I imagine taking a cross section of this half bagel, that's the bottom part here. Uh -huh. So, um, and so, yeah, the statement is, I mean, the, the, the Einstein-Rosen bridge here is a slice that's common to both the Euclidean and the Lorentzian se section, right? So we know that uh, this slice in the Lorentzian geometry is an annulus. This is, this is the wormhole. I see. That's this Einstein-Rosen bridge here. And this picture is supposed to be a picture of a path in a row that's supposed to be on a geometry that ends on this cylinder. One hole. Yeah. Okay. And then I can Lorentz continue it to make this black hole. And I'm just saying that the this has the right topology, right? And in fact, maybe maybe say differently, I think that the hot Hawking state is by definition the thing that if I take its norm, it gives me the Euclidean Euclidean partition function, the pattern goes. So basically I'm asking what object do I take what state do I take whose norm gives me this still torus? And the answer is you cut you cut the torus at a moment of time reflection symmetry. Maybe that's those are the words I'm missing. So it's important that this geometry has a has a time reflection symmetry at this slice here. Um, and so it, it if, if I cut it there, it defines this you know cat and brow overlap when I put the bra on that. Um, yeah, but, but at least you see the topology matches, right? This this is exactly this topology. Right, right, that's right. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so I, yeah. So there may be other topology that you can also relate by some relation like this. And is this a, just the simplest one that you consider or are there some particular reason this is um, I think using this geometry with the time reflection symmetry. So I could have drawn like, um, I mean, I, I could have, you know, if, if there was a hygienic surface, I filled it in and there was a time reflection symmetry about some surface, then I can, I can define a state by cutting along that time slice. I think the crucial property is this property here, right? That the overlap, the overlap of the state with itself will give me back the, uh, Euclidean path integral. So, so I could have done that with, uh, I guess, um, yeah, I mean, I could have done S3. It's, it's really two solid balls. Um, 
with the, the surface identified. So, so Z of S3 would be also uh, overlap of a hard hawking state, except now the hard hawking state is the state I get by filling in this sphere. So, so, so these would be the B3s. Yeah, thanks. So, so now I want to discuss the bell Kilber space, um, which we want to factorize. So it's well known that when we impose asymptotic uh, ADS boundary conditions, we get very thorough edge modes. This is the work of Brown and Hanau. So where does it come from? You can see very explicitly that so the, the, these components of the gauge field along the um, spatial and uh, time direction uh, take this form. It's parameterized by one function. And this function is precisely the uh, Virasoro stress tensor that generates the Virasoro symmetry. Now, when we study these two-sided uh, geometries, there will be four stress tensor components because there's a left and right side, and there's also the chiral and anti-chiral part of the gauge field. Uh, and these stress tensors will parameterize uh, the phase space of two-sided geometries. So these were written down by Bernardos. I didn't write the geometries explicitly. Uh, now it's important that these four stress tensors are not independent. The zero modes are linked. And the reason is very simple. You can look at the geometry of this spatial slice. The zero modes of the stress tensor is related to the integral of the gauge field around the cycle here. And they're linked just because of the fact there is a wormhole connecting them. Uh, you can think about this as measuring some Wilson line that's threading, threading the wormhole. And this Wilson line determines some parameter P, which is going to parameterize this zero mode degree of freedom. And they're going to label the black hole quantum numbers, the spin and the, uh, and the mass. So because of this kind of, um, uh, so, so, so in, in this story, there are zero mode degrees of freedom. And then there's also uh, the boundary gravitons, the Virasoro, um, the, the edge modes generated by the Virasoro algebra. So the upshot is that the bulk Hilbert space has a chiral and anti chiral part that's both built out of Virasoro representations. So these Virasoro representations have a primary label and a descendant label. And for each chiral and anti chiral part, they don't break up naturally into just left and right independently. They're, uh, there is this correlation in the primary label because of this Wilson line. And if we cut this big O in half and ask what is the hard hawking state, uh, we can write this down very explicitly. It has two, a chiral anti chiral part. Um, and this is just a, a souped up version of a thermal field double state uh, with an extra sort of density of states here. Now, um, what I want to focus on are these basis states that we're going to factorize, right? These have uh, a single primary label for both sides, but then different descendant labels on the two sides. Uh, this notation is hiding some quantum numbers. They're hiding some SL2R times SL2R quantum numbers that we would have gotten by quantizing this SL2R times SL2R gauge theory, which gives us a boundary WCW model. WCW model. Um, now this has a smoothie symmetry that's labeled by SL2R continuous series representations, which are also labeled by the same P. But these representations have a degenerate zero mode subspace. These are labeled by these extra quantum numbers I left, I right, that we didn't put in this notation. What the ADS3 binary condition does is project into a particular uh, zero mode vector which I denoted by these indices. And because it's frozen, I didn't put it in this uh, notation. But when we talk about factorization, we need to restore these indices because they tell us some useful information. They tell us that the ground state subspace uh, is given by representations of some SL2Q plus. So I'm gonna explain what this object is, but for now, I just wanna observe that these indices are there to begin with that are associated with SL2. Once we explain why the representations of SL2 Q plus, then the structure we need to define subregenerate functions and factorization maps will appear. 
In fact, I'm going to give you just the answer right away because it's so natural. In the partition function, we had some density of states that was given by this quantum dimensions. So there's a natural factorization map that is immediately going to give the right entropy and is shrinkable by our definition. The idea is that we take a subregion state to be uh, one of these Katz Moody, uh, well, one of these states I wrote down earlier. So one of these guys. Um, but we introduce an extra quantum number, S, and then we impose that. Um, this is, is going to be SL2R, you know, it's going to transform under SL2R plus and the projector onto a fixed P, a fixed representation of SL2 plus um, has a trace that's given by this density of states. So in other words, when we count the quantum numbers S, we count it with this measure. Um, then the factorization map that we need is exactly given by this formula. We take uh, this single basis element and we write it as an entangled sum. So probably the picture is more useful than the formulas. We take a state labeled by P or P bar, and then we factorize it by summing over these edge mode labels. It turns out that this abstract formula is exactly the co-product on this quantum group. And the topic of the next few slides is to, to explain what exactly is this co-product? Uh, what is this mathematical object here that defines this factorization map? So what is SLQ2R plus? We've mentioned this several times without defining it. A very straightforward definition to following. Oh, excuse is, me. Yeah. Sorry, uh, maybe you already mentioned, how do I understand those age modes? Are they, are they, are they the age modes that we, we consider just like the transcendent theory of a compact age group? Right, are, so are I, like, I, like yeah, What's, what's the property of those age modes? Exactly. So I haven't explained it yet because I just basically did something. Uh, I, I, I mean, on SATS, I just said that what we need is a bunch of edge modes such that when we count them, we count them with this measure. And I'm just telling you that there is something called a code product on this quantum group that provides you those edge modes with exactly the right measure. But I haven't said anything about what they are. I, I just said that sort of structurally, that's what we need, right? I mean, it's sort of obvious from the form of a partition function that we have these density of states. And so to give a state counting interpretation to, to this dim QP, we just need to count states to get dim QP, right? Um, so these slides are supposed to explain what this SLQ2 plus is and also what those edge modes are. And um, how do we know they are on the edge? Like they are localized in two dimensions, one plus one D. Um, so in the, yeah, so so the one way to see the, the sort of on the edge is that um, they sort of have zero modular energy. So um, the, in general, when I, when, when I have like a subregion, Um, there is something called a modular Hamiltonian, which is sort of the generative boost. Um, and this thing, this modular Hamiltonian vanishes right at the entangling surface. And so we'll see in a moment that um, these, so, so these edge modes are zero eigenstates of the modular Hamiltonian. And that's one way to see why they should be localized to the edge. Um, but to be honest, that's not, uh, I, I'm not entirely committed to that in the following sense. Um, the, 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 yeah, so, so what I want to say is that in the topological quantum field theory, um, in, in that sort of uh, uh, formulation, we're supposed to assign certain structures to uh, mathematical structures to surfaces of each co-dimension. So this is S. This S is a co-dimension two object. This is an entangling surface. Um, and maybe the more precise statement that I'm going to make is that the the TQFT assigns to S this co-dimension two surface some kind of uh, representation category 
of SLQ2+. And uh, this statement, I think, doesn't necessarily mean that the edge modes are exactly on the edge, right? It tells me abstractly the, the TQFT assigns a mathematical a category to this location, this, this uh, co-dimension two surface. Um, but uh, yeah, I, in some sense, I'm, I'm not entirely committed to exactly you know, where the edge modes are. Basically, what I am committed to is the, the subregion Hilbert space. So the point is that the TQFT is going to give you a sign for your subregion Hilbert space. And to know what the subregion Hilbert space is, I need to know what the boundaries are. So here there's one boundary labeled by E, one labeled by R. Um, so I could give another argument later on for why, why it, you might think that it's localized to the edge, but um, for now, what I call edge modes, I'm, I think it's easy for me just to say, edge modes is whatever is inside a subregion of space that is in some sense extra, it's not what was in the uh, larger Hilbert space, or the original physical Hilbert space. Um, yeah, so at, at this moment, so I, I, in this point in my site, I haven't shown you why they're initially on the edge. I just, I just gave you an ansatz for the Hilbert space. Okay, thanks. Uh, in, a, in a usual case of a, a like a fractional quantum hole, quantum hole states, there is some gap in the bulk and gap closing on the edge. So we know they are edge modes. And once the gap close, the, the, the reopen of the gap can go to different vacuum. Are there something similar here? Are there some gap closing and reopen in the notion of an energy gap closing? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, so yeah, I don't have, to be honest, so I'm okay. giving a very abstract notion of the edge modes here in this talk. So that would be work in progress. We're still trying to understand better what the, yeah, what the proper, I mean, essentially the edge modes should be some microstates of the bulk quantum gravity. So to, to understand the nature of the edge modes, I actually have to, in some sense, solve the bulk quantum gravity, which is string theory. And there's no way that pure 3D gravity would, would, would tell you that. Like, it, it's not going to know about that. Um, yeah, so. Nori, yeah, please go on. Sure. OK, so a very direct definition of SLQ2 plus is we take a 2 by 2 matrix except that the entries themselves are operators. That might be seem a bit weird, but that's sort of how a quantum group can be defined. These entries are operators on some L2 space, but they have to have positive spectrum. So that explains the plus. Um, now these operators um, satisfy some communication relations for SL, this appropriate to SLQ2. But maybe a better definition, which we'll use, is that um, some kind of a quantum group or even a quantum semigroup is really defined by the algebra functions on it. So we take this to the square integral, integrable functions, L2 of G. And this algebra has a product and a co-product. The product is pointwise multiplication. And the co-product is just saying that if I take a function of a single copy of G, I can map it to a function of two copies of G just by using the group multiplication law. Um, another concrete way to think about it, this algebra is that it's given, it, it has a basis given by product of the matrix elements, these A, B, C, D, here. So in the second definition, what I'm trying to tell you is that to understand what SLQ2 plus is, I should understand L2, the L2 space on it. Think about this as a space of quantum wave functions that you get by solving a Schrodinger equation, which in this case would be a Casimir equation. The solutions are found and organized by symmetry. So for example, spherical harmonics are representation matrix elements of SO3 uh, mod U1. So let me explain the symmetry perspective a bit more. So um, a group always acts on its own L L2 space by the regular representation. The regular representation is just saying that I multiply inside the argument of my group, um, of my function by on the left and the right. Now, um, there is a particular decomposition of the L2 space that arises under this uh, regular representation. It's known as pre valid theorem. So on the right-hand side, VR are the representations of my group G. So what this formula says is that um, there's a basis 
of my L2 space given by the representation basis elements. And uh, they, they're complete in the, in the usual quantum mechanical sense. In, in a very literal sense, um, this formula is telling you that I can reconstruct the left-hand side from the right-hand side. So for example, the multiplication rule here is the multiplication rule of these matrices. And that's given by the clutch gordon um, coefficients that is part of the data of this representation category uh, of the group. So, so what I'm, the, the punchline here is that uh, a symmetry is really defined by its representations. Now, we can make the symmetry non-compact by just changing the right-hand side to have a continuous integral over representations. Um, then there's a Planchot measure. This is the density of states. And now I still have a basis of matrix, matrix elements, except that the dimension of a representation is replaced by the Planchot measure. And I still have a uh, same kind of uh, resolution of identity. So now to understand the L2 space of SLQ2 plus, we need to know how it decomposes into representations. And uh, Teschner uh, proved that the decomposition of the space is just given by uh, these representations of SLQ2, which is a more maybe uh, simpler object, right? It doesn't have the plus there. But the weird thing is that it's only certain representations of SLQ2, it's a continuous series representations with a particular measure, which is exactly our double sinh function. So the point of this equation is to say that rather than seeing that these are some very special subsets of representations of this group, we should think that VP are just the representations of this semi-quantum group. That's sort of the content of this equation. Um, is giving you the representation category for this, this object. And in fact, the representation matrices have been worked out and they have exactly this quantum dimension. Now, the reason that this structure arises in our story is that uh, Ponsant Teschner showed that this representation category actually uh, solves the modular, modular bootstrap for the Ribble theory. Ribble theory is sort of a universal theory for various representations. What, it, what does it mean that this representation category solves the modular bootstrap? It means that there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the representation category of this quantum group and the representation category of various sort of algebra. So every quantum group representation, VP, is mapped to a various sort of representation in a way that the representation ring maps to the fusion algebra. So the tensor product rules and how they decompose for the quantum group is the fusion rule for the various sort of. Um, now, uh, how does this story relate to our bulk Hilbert space? Remember that our bulk Hilbert space is also built from various sort of representations, um, and they're given by these spaces elements. Now, the fact that there's an equivalence between representations of various sort and the qu quantum group representation means that we can identify the zero mode subspace, this, these I left and I right indices. Um, as representation matrices of SLQ2+. plus. So in particular, this is the, the key equation that we think about the wave function in the zero mode subspace as a representation matrix with a definite normalization. And once we have this formula, there's a natural way to factorize these states that live on this Einstein-Wilson bridge. In fact, they come from splitting a Wilson line. The Wilson line is exactly the sub, this, this configuration space variable G which we can think of a Wilson line going uh, through the wormhole. So this factorization map is that, that pops up is just the co-product on L2 of G. Anytime I have L2 of G, um, there's a decomposition into representation matrices. And there's always a factorization map that maps to two copies of L2 G. It's exactly what we mentioned before. We just pull back using the multiplication map so we write G as G1 times G2, and then we use the representation property. That always gives us an entangled sum. What we see here is extra edge mode indices. These Cs are always entangled into a singlet under uh, right mode location of G1 and left mode location of G2. And when we have this entangled state, it always is an entangled entropy of log times the dimension of a representation. If I, if I trace over one side, this is always the entropy I get. 
So in a gravity theory, G is our SLQ2 plus, or two copies of it. And L2 of G is a zero mode subspace on this uh, Einstein Rosen bridge. And the code product is splits this Wilson line into two, into two subregion Wilson lines. And because the splitting is of this form, it always gives me an entanglement entropy that's log of the quantum dimension. And that's exactly the form of a black hole entropy. So to summarize, um, we had a hard Hawking state that we wanted to factorize with a shrinkable body condition. Um, and that factorization map, it turns out is given by a co-product on a quantum group that only acts on the zero mode subspace. You can think of it as this, this sort of pair of pants diagram that splits one annulus into two annuli. The subregion wave functions are just representation matrices of this quantum group. Um, and this is the factorization map. The key point here is that, um, and this some, uh, yeah, so Jibin, I don't know if this answers the question, the edge modes are just these indices that transform under the quantum group. But what's important about them for our purpose is they have no descendants. They're one-to-one -one with Verisoro representations, but they don't have descendants. So they share a quantum number P, um, but because they don't have the descendants, you get finite edge mode and entropy. In particular, because this, this factorization is shrinkable, what this means is that um, it gives you a row V, a density matrix that reproduces the whole path integral. And therefore, when you complete minus trace row log row, you get the whole entropy, right? The, the full entropy. And the full entropy is exactly what we call the generalized entropy. In the classical limit, you reproduce um, just this log of the quantum dimension at the saddle, and that's exactly area of 4G Newton. So I should stop here because it's been an hour. So I know this talk was supposed to be 90 minutes, but Juven, do you want me to pause now? And or do you want me to keep going? Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, what's the standard protocol? Was well, it's ninety minutes, so you have time, at okay. least. Um, but but this is a good time to stop because uh, I'm going to talk about the RT formula and um, everything I'm going to say is a repeat in some sense of the black hole case uh, up to conform map. So if you have any questions about what I said earlier, you should ask me now. Okay. Then, then I'll keep it going. Um, so now we're gonna consider um, the calculation of a single interval uh, entanglement entropy in a hol holographic CFT in the global vacuum state. So our effective battery theory was supposed to describe uh, CFT in the high temperature limit. So it might sound strange that now I'm gonna apply it to study the global vacuum, which is not high temperature. But because of the unreal effect, um, when we compute entanglement entropy, we're precisely probing the high temperature limit of a theory. And the reason is that from the point of view of a sub-region uh, observer, let's like say a, a render observer, um, he sees high temperature near the entanglement surface. And that's where the entropy is coming from. And that's why our theory is useful there. Now, usually the render entropy is associated to the entanglement of render oscillator modes. And indeed, um, say for a 2D CFT, uh, these would be the contributions of descendants. This is true for C smaller than or equal to one CFTs, but for our irrational CFT with C bigger than one, the dominant contribution to this render entropy actually comes from the primaries, not the descendants, not the oscillator modes. This is completely analogous to what happened in the black hole case. And the main, uh, the idea is that we're gonna, we, after doing a conformal map, the single interval reduced density matrix is gonna map to one chiral copy of the black hole uh, reduced density matrix on one, on one side that we studied earlier. So let's start with the boundary calculation of, um, of entanglement entropy. We want to do the vacuum state, which is prepared by disk. As we mentioned earlier, we want to factorize it with the path integral. And to do that, we have to in introduce a little regulator. We remove two semi-disks from the uh, two entangling points on the circle. So we have two intervals of length x 
and L minus X, where L is the total length of the circle. And this regular geometry can be mapped to this, uh, this half of a cylinder is a strip. If I took the uh, norm of the state, it's a sphere. And after factorization, it becomes um, a cylinder in annulus. This conformal map is going to take this annulus into a very long cylinder as epsilon goes to zero with length given by this expression here. Now, I didn't tell you what this E is. This E is some boundary state we should have inserted here so that it gives you back the sphere. We're going to assume that it's conformally invariant. But any conformally invariant boundary state is always a sum of Ishibashi states. These are states that satisfy this equation where the stress tensor with one leg in the perpendicular and parallel direction to the norm to the boundary um, annihilates the state. And the state is labeled by a primary of, of your CFT. Uh, now, in this long cylinder limit, the vacuum Ishibashi state always dominates. So in fact, what we're going to do is just, we just choose the entanglement boundary state to be this vacuum Ishibashi state. Uh, we, we know for sure that it's a good approximation, and uh, there are many reasons why we think this is a good choice, but let's just make that choice. And then we'll see the return of the vacuum character, because when I insert a vacuum Ishibashi state on this long cylinder, I propagate it using this sort of a closed string propagator. I'm going to get back the vacuum character um, with the modular parameter being, uh, yeah, Q is exponential of minus twice the length. But just as we did in the black hole calculation, when we want the state counting interpretation of this partition function, um, we should switch to the, the other channel, the open string channel, where we think of it as a trace. That just involves doing a modular transform. Again, with the same modular S matrix, but not only one copy. And we get a very similar looking partition function with a dim QP as the density of states. Um, and now the, the modular parameter, the one that describes our statistical, statistical partition function is one with two pi squared over L. Um, and this two pi squared over L is an effective inverse temperature for the observer inside the subregion A here. Now, um, we're gonna try to understand the state counting properties of this partition function in the bulk. But for now, um, we just want to note that it gives you the right entropy. So uh, we can take the high temperature, uh, sorry. Um, maybe I want this to be, um, yeah, we take the high temperature limit. So then the circle is very small and the length is very long. Uh, and we, it's the same argument as we made earlier, right? So high temperature means this exponent is going to zero, then large P dominates. If addition, in addition, I take a large center charge limit, then the B parameter gets very big. And the saddle point is gonna give me uh, the thermal entropy as a log of a dimension, of a quantum dimension, evaluated at the saddle. And this gives me the, exactly the entanglement entropy of interval, which is C over three log L. Uh, but we want, now that, that's just a, a confirmation that this gives the right entropy, but now we want a state counting interpretation in the bulk. So we repeat the exercise we did with the black hole. We first ask, what is the bulk path integral that would give me this uh, boundary partition function? Well, the important thing is that our Ishibashi state satisfied this uh, boundary condition, which is designed so that this Dublin trick works. In other words, we can replace uh, a non chiral theory on a cylinder with a chiral theory on a, on a double cylinder, which is the torus. Um, this is just saying that chi zero here can be viewed as the chiral part of a CFT partition function on the uh, torus. If we want a bulk dual, we need to fill in this cylinder. Now, there is actually more than one way to fill it in, but the way I'm going to choose is this way. When I fill in the cylinder, the boundary cylinder is M. I fill it in with a manifold N union Q. 
and instead of the, the middle part of the cylinder, but notice that to have a bulk whose boundary equals M, I need to add these caps, these Qs. So uh, if I take the boundary of N union Q, then I get back M. But this is probably even simpler in the double geometry. In the double geometry, I just have a torus, the boundary torus. So filling it in just means filling in the solid torus. So there is a bulk version, of, there must be a bulk version of this doubling trick, provided you choose the right sort of boundary action of Q here. So I'm not telling you exactly what this Q is, but something very analogous has been worked out in, uh, by Takinagi and, and other collaborators in the program called ADS-BCFT. So there they precisely ask the question, when I have a boundary manifold with, uh, we have a boundary CFT on M, what is the bulk ADS space-time that's due to it? And they showed that if I have an interval, this is a spatial slice of M, if I have an interval that's long, corresponding to a, some kind of high temperature limit here, then the, there's a bulk dual that involves these end of the world brains, these Qs, um, and that go all the way into and it ends on the Euclidean horizon. So this Euclidean horizon would be some, uh, some the middle of the cylinder here. And this is a spatial slice that's going around in a trace in the cylinder. Uh, so in, in these papers, they worked out the bulk action in gravity. There's an Einstein-Hilbert term that lives on N. There's a Gibbons Hawking term on the Qs and also a, sort of a brain action that lives on the cues. They've also um, they started to give the churn simons formulation of these boundary actions. And, um, but since I'm not concerned with saddle points, I'm just concerned with the TQFT, I'm, I'm basically assuming that this bulk exists by virtue of the fact that we know we can fill in the solid torus, right? We know that doing the solid torus pathogen growth in transcendence theory gives us back this chi knot here. Um, and then I think that implies that there must be a story here in the half geometry, in the uh, D2 orbifolded geometry that also is consistent. So now that we have a bulk geometry, we have to factorize it and we play the same game as we did before. In the double geometry is literally exactly the same picture. I have a solid torus which I must, um, from which I must remove a two. Now, in the original picture, what does that mean? It means I introduced uh, a tube with some shrinkable boundary condition E. And now when I cut the geometry in half, it looks like a, a factorized state. So the factorized state splits the, the, the bulk uh, slice, which is a strip into V and V bar. But again, when I doubled it, it's exactly the same picture I drew before. So my factorization map, it's just a chiral copy uh, of the factorization map for a massless BTC black hole. This kind of entanglement is exactly the same entanglement structure for the black hole, uh, but for single chiral sector. And because this satisfies the shrinkable boundary condition, it automatically gives, gives me a trace interpretation to this, um, to this solid torus. And um, the entanglement entropy, again, uh, will just be the, the thermal entropy. The calculation hasn't changed from what, what I did earlier. So, so this calculation of entropy is exactly the same, but I just given it a, a state counting interpret interpretation. Okay, so I should stop. From, I'm gonna go to the last section now, but uh, any questions so far? So actually, sorry, let me ask something naive. Uh, yeah. Can you just make sure, like this picture, where's the three D box and where are the two D boundary? Yeah. So the M. So yeah. So let me go back one. Um, M, M is the two D boundary, and N union Q is the bulk. In in this case, the on the right hand side, the solid torus is the bulk. And the T2, the boundary torus, is, is the boundary. 
So the right-hand side is sort of simple to understand. There's literally no difference from what I said earlier. People have checked it. You can compute the solid torus partition function in Chen Simon's theory. It gives you back the vacuum character on the boundary torus. This is more subtle because I have to take a Z2 quotient of this to get the left-hand side. And it leaves me with some fixed point surfaces Q. Um, and so I was just, uh, I, I didn't work out, for example, in a saddle point approximation, there's three saddle geometry with these Q, Q being some kind of brains. So I just appeal to some work of Takenagi that says that such a solution of Einstein's equation exists. Is that clear? Sure. OK. Um, so let me summarize by giving you the TQFT perspective. So I've done basically two cases, a black hole and uh, uh, black hole entropy and single interval entanglement entropy for vacuum state. But what is the larger structure here? Um, I want to claim that should be a larger structure, which is a bulk extended TQFT. And it should be a structure that consistently cuts open the bulk geometry with edge modes. So, but I want to define TQ, TQFT in this abstract way. The TQFT is just a rule that assigns certain mathematical objects to surfaces of each codimension. So in a d-dimensional space-time, if I have a d-manifold, I get a number. If I d minus one manifold, uh, the TQFT gives me a Hilbert space. If I have a d minus two manifold, it gives me a boundary category, which for us would be a representation category of some edge mode symmetry. And once I have some uh, data in this uh, sequence, it determines everything above it. In particular, if I go all the way down to a point, according to Jacob Leary, I get back the whole TQFT. Now, uh, in, a good example is transcendence theory with compact gauge group. And I'm just gonna use an example of what these assignments are. So if I have a sphere, it's co-dimension one, so uh, TQFT gives me a Hilbert space. If I have a circle, it gives me a representation category, which is in this case, rep loop LG, which is loop group of G. But there's also a relation between the different tiers, right? So if I fill in the, the sphere, the TQFT should give me a state that's inside whatever I call Z of the sphere. So Z of the sphere is a Hilbert space, the, the ball which I get by filling the sphere is a state in the helper space. Similarly, if I fill in the circle with a disk that's punctured, it should give me back an element of rep LG. But these are precisely the edge modes, right? So what this rule is saying is that once I specify the boundary category, then the helper space on a subregion, which is a disk, must be made of representations of, of, of this category. Now, there's sort of an amusing but useful fact. If I have an annulus, this corresponds to, in some sense, an evolution from one circle to another circle. Um, so it's some kind of mapping from one circle to another circle. In this case, it's identity mapping. But it's identity mapping between categories. And it turns out that the identity functor, so to speak, is the Hilbert space. It's precisely the Hilbert space of transcendence theory on the annulus. And the reason has to do with the fact that, roughly speaking, in this, this representation category is an abstract version of a Hilbert space. So whereas a Hilbert space would have an identity that, that is given by a resolution of the identity as one, is sum over basis states. Oops, sorry. Uh, identity one is sum over basis states. If I think about this one level higher, then this gives me this uh, resolution identity that's actually a Hilbert space, where each basis element is a vector space. So uh, if you look at calculations of partition functions and tangent entropy, all of it comes from knowing what you assign to your circle. So TQFT is defined by what you assign to the circle. Um, so what I want to propose is that what I've been telling you in this talk is a very similar structure, I, except that I have two kinds of circles. I have an asymptotic circle and a bulk circle. And they're assigned to different representation categories. 
But these representation categories are not completely you know, unrelated. They're related by some functor. The representations are in one-to-one -one correspondence. And now for each kind of surface that you know, ends and starts on these circles, I can assign some consistent notion uh, of some structure from these representation categories. So for example, the annulus Hilbert space is the identity functor. Um, the, uh, sorry, I think maybe there is a little, um, okay, yeah, so th this should be two copies of Beer's oral, but I just put one copy. Um, if I have an annulus between the asymptotic boundary and a bulk boundary, now it's a functor between the Virasoro representation category and the quantum group representation category. And that functor is the Hilbert space. It's a Hilbert space where the P labels are correlated between the inner and outer boundary. Um, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not gonna go through in detail, but the point is that the, the larger structure that I'm getting at that defines what it means to consistently cut open the bulk and in some sense, that's what you mean by having a good definition of bulk uh, factorization. It can't be just, I invent for you a new factorization map every time you give me a state and an entanglement cut. Okay, so I wanna conclude with some obvious questions. So we need more to do more checks on the RT formula, for example, um, excited states, different entanglement cuts involving multiple intervals, adding matter, we also did not give a classical description of the bulk edge modes. So uh, Jivan asked a good question, what, what is the precise nature of these edge modes? We gave a very abstract definition, so we should try to be more concrete and be specific about it. We could also think about what happens if we change from ADS to disorder space. Um, in fact, uh, the Trent Simons calculation of disorder entropy has been done, so we can ask, does it have a state counting interpretation? Now, there's also some puzzles or conceptual puzzles, which is in condensed matter systems, um, anions are not fundamental, right? The, the microscopic degrees of freedom are qubits or electrons. But there's some puzzle here about gravity, whether the same is true in gravity. The reason is that there's a subtle mismatch between the leading, uh, between the gravity calculation and the gauge theory calculation, because the leading gravity entropy is entirely captured by the anions, by these Wilson lines that we cut. But on the lattice, uh, the leading term is an area term that does not come from anions. It comes from local qubit entanglement. So now I'm referring to the fact that on the lattice, there's this area term, and then there's a modular S matrix. Now this term comes from cutting anions, but this one comes from just qubits localized to the entangling surface. So it makes sense that in the condensed matter setting that we would say that these come from the collective excitations um, and maybe these come from the UV microscopic degrees of freedom. But in gravity, there is no such area term. Everything is comes from the anions. So it's a bit confusing now whether the anions are really describing the microstate. I would like to say that that, that what I call the gravitation of an anion is actually describing the strong coupling limit of bulk microstates. Uh, and to speak to Jubin's question, um, he asked whether these states are localized to the boundary. And I basically gave a vague answer that we don't have a very precise description of them. Um, one of the questions we don't have answered is whether there, what does the dotted line mean? Like, is this an end of the world brain? Or is this some kind of like fuzzball like geometry that caps off? So we don't we don't know that. We just know that the single sided states should should be disconnected and entangled. Um, so and finally, it turns out that a very similar structure appears in the topological string. Um, and there, unlike gravity, we do know the microstates that describe the subregion, and they're just the brains of the topological string theory. So it will be very nice if physical string theory works that way too, and that our anion edge modes are just counting brains, but uh, I don't know how to show that yet, but that's sort of where we're going. So I think I should wrap up now because I'm very close to the end. 
thank you very much. Thank you, Gabriel, for the very nice, very interesting result. Any question from the audience? Comments? Please feel uh, Can I ask a naive question? Uh, well, so for, for a given like setup, for example, in the setup or, or others or other examples, uh, what is this uh, 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 technical difficulties to calculate the, the factorization math? Um, sorry, when you said particular status, I didn't understand what-, what uh, uh, I just have uh, some very vague uh, picture in my mind that, uh, for example, for example you, if you want to calculate other, other cases, um, I mean, so what's in this uh, technical difficulties to, to, uh, to find this factorization map? Yeah, so, um, and we can give an example. So suppose you take um, a sphere and now you have four holes. Mm -hmm. so, so this corresponds to if you have, um, if I, I map this to a very large plane, then I have, an in, I, I have uh, two intervals. I, I put two intervals here. So um, this is region V1 and V2, and then there's the boundary. Um, so V1 union V2 complement is these three guys. Huh. And now we have to put a whole, we have to remove a disk from the boundary of the two intervals. So now, whatever bulk, um, yeah, now, now, again, I mentioned in the simple case of a single, um, well, you could say that I could do the same trick I did before, which is to double this geometry in some sense. Um, but the question is really, we don't know exactly what the bulk geometry is, right? And we don't know whether the bulk calculation in some sense matches the boundary calculation. So let me add some more complication to this. Now I add some punctures. So not, now it's not, now there's some puncture at infinity. So now we want a bulk dual. Um, it's not entirely clear to me what the bulk dual is now. I mean, you could think of various things. For example, you can imagine um, the, uh, you can imagine that I connected. So these are the four holes here and I've connected them in the bulk. And then I'm maybe the bulk two is a complement. So there's a bulk, I, it's very hard for me to draw. I'm not sure if I'm gonna succeed, but um, you might think the bulk two is like the complement of this little uh, four hole sphere I've drawn in the bulk, right? Like, the point is, it's not, yeah, the, the, the surface has become more complicated. And then it's not clear what is the correct topology. You just got the correct topology of the bulk and tangent surface. And then you have to check that it gives a sensible factorized form of the boundary calculation. In other words, the boundary thing is perfectly well defined. This thing here right, it, it's some endpoint function, two point function on, of a CFT on a, um, on a manifold with boundaries. Um, you just have to check that the bulk calculation gives you back that. I mean, that's really the, yes. the thing to do. So, uh, to, I mean, they, they have to satisfy what you just mentioned, the shrink of a boundary calculation, right? So, we don't want to find it. Uh, uh, sorry, just I, I had to close the blinds because they they are really uh, sorry. Let me. I mean, I didn't hear your question. Can you repeat? Oh, okay. So I mean, essentially, you have to like let this to. I mean, to to find this factorization map, you need to uh, let this uh, 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 to 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 let's procedure to satisfy what you just mentioned, like the shrink of a boundary condition. Yeah, I need the shrink exactly. The shrink of a boundary condition is just saying that 
by introducing the entangling surface in the bulk, I have not changed my partition function, right? Exactly, I have to check that. Okay, and so um, I want to say that I shouldn't have to just invent a new way of doing it every time. I should be able to say, here's a TQFT. It, 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 it's a functor from, you know, a geometric category. The TQFT maps geometry a geometric category to some other category, some representation category. And there should be a consistent notion of this map, this functor. I see. And, and I, I, sh I shouldn't have to work out it out every time. It should just be given to me by this mapping that, um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Any other question, comments? Yeah, maybe you can ask you another question. Yeah. yeah if I understand correctly that uh, you, 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 you found this SL2RQ plus, uh, is because like this measure, sort of measure gives the right uh, uh, state counting results that you get from the uh, boundary theory side, right? So is there any other quantum groups that satisfies this measure? Uh, um, is this clear? Well, it, it, in some sense, if there is, there will be another representation category that is equivalent to Virasoro. So I would be surprised if there is. Um, maybe, I, I don't think so, but I don't know. Um, so I should say that, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, I, I don't know, but what I wanna say is one can ask a different question, which is suppose I take another chiral algebra, not the Virasoro. So notice that in the very beginning of the talk, I just restricted to the Virasoro. Right. But you see, I have many holographic CFTs and they don't just have Virasoro symmetry because for example, the black holes might have charge. So these have to be replaced by some characters of a Kasmudi symmetry or some, something or W infinity or whatever. Um, and once you check that this still is, is still true that the mo you, you can play the same game, right? You, you expect the vacuum character to dominate. Mm -hmm. And in fact, for Linde check that uh, for higher spin theory, this relation between module S matrices and the uh, black hole entropy is still correct. And so the highest spin algebra is another example where log of S0P is, is the right, um, gets the right entry. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think that most, most, yeah, maybe this is the opposite of a question, but the thing that I really want to know is like, suppose you have charged black holes and you have other chiral algebras. It seems like this should also work. Um, and, and yeah, so, so I think your proposal is based on like this for a given like this sort of measure and the SL2QR had this had this the exact result that you want. So you make this proposal that this geometry is or this as a content group uh, description in like the bulk dual of the boundary theory. So if it's not unique, then this proposal will be like uh, it's interesting, but in another way. Well, I, I should say that this proposal is, you know, is not, is not, ex I'm not sure if it's going to be, I, I think it's more or less unique. And let me say this something. Um, entanglement boundary conditions are not unique. I mean, we know in gauge three, there could be electric or magnetic boundary conditions. So the shrinkable boundary condition does not have to give you a unique choice. This is true in general. So for example, when I discussed CFTs, I said that we choose the Ishibashi state, the vacuum Ishibashi state, but actually, in some sense, any state that contains a vacuum will be shrinkable, right? Because if I take this long cylinder limit, then um, the long cylinder limit always projects into the vacuum. And the vacuum is a disk that closes these holes, right? But the differences will be small. In other words, um, well, I want to say that if 
to even say there is a way to define entanglement consistently, there should be some structure like an extended TQFT. Um, and in some sense, uh, I, I'm saying that, um, yeah, I'm saying that that structure should have a boundary category. And if you tell mm -hmm. me there are, there's more than one choice of this boundary category, um, uh, yeah, I just guess, or I was wondering, I'm not telling you, sorry. Okay, okay. Well, <laughs> let me say differently, though. It's not okay. easy, right? It, maybe, maybe I didn't make the clear here. The boundary category has to satisfy many constraints. Mm -hmm. right? like, I, I can't just really nearly make up a dimension or something, right? The modular tensor category has a lot of rules for everything to fit. The braiding has to, fusion and braiding and dimension off it together. Um, it doesn't mean that it's unique, but I think that, yeah, it's not, it's not easy just to invent another structure. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, as I have to, yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you, yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. If there's oh, no... Another question, let's just thanks Gabriel again, people can still stay to discuss.